with a bit of understanding of the probability stuff behind us, we can return to actually focusing on the queuing theory component. Uh, and I want to talk about convergence. If you think back to calculus class, uh, if you can remember all the way back to first year, uh, you would have discussed a limit, a limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. Uh, and you will have an answer to this if that function does converge on a value. So if the function f of x is 1 over x squared, uh, it is possible to compute you know, the limit as x goes to infinity. And it does have a value, you know, the value in that case goes to 0. Uh, and we would consider that to have an answer. Answer. Um, some functions don't have convergence. Uh, if, if f of x in that situation is, um, just for the sake of an example, sine x, won't converge. Doesn't settle down to any particular value. Uh, it just keeps oscillating back and forth uh, forever, and even as x goes to infinity, uh, it doesn't converge. We are uh, interested in talking about um, a system where our random variables do in fact converge. Uh, those ones are a lot nicer to work with, of course, um, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, when we talk about flipping a coin and you know, if it comes up heads four times or something, that's fine. Um, it comes up heads four times and it doesn't match our expectation that it should be about half heads and half tails. However, we have convergence if given enough samples and enough sample paths, uh, then eventually we get convergence on say 0.5 probability of getting heads uh, that we would expect. So you can't read too much into one single observation you know, or even one single set of experiments, uh, but we have convergence if in the long run, as uh, we are continuing to do more and more experiments, we see it closing in on a particular value. So um, some sample paths don't converge. Um, uh, the, if you keep flipping the coin and it always comes up heads 100% of the time, um, you know that will never converge on the 0 0.5 value. Um, but they have a probability mass of zero, which is a fancy way of saying they are incredibly unlikely. Uh, and there may even be uncountably many uh, bad paths, but each with probability zero, and that's okay. Uh, things that have probability zero, um, it turns out, aren't things that can never happen. Um, this is just, you know, how the probability of zero kind of thing is defined in uh, probability theory. Uh, if, if it's, you know, truly impossible, then it's, you know, not even in the sample space. You know, you can't flip a coin and have it come uh, you know, up uh, six because that's just not happening. Um, but, you know, something like landing on edge might have probability zero because it's, you know, virtually impossible, but not completely impossible. Uh, this is, uh, of course, not a uh, statistics course. So there are uncountably many bad paths, you know, where you're really unlucky, um, but they're incredibly unlikely. Uh, and what we expect to see is something that resembles convergence. Uh, and what convergence tells us is that uh, in spite of whatever initial conditions we start off with, things eventually settle to a steady state of some sort. Uh, and so um, if in this graph here, um, the little uh, omega 1, 2, 3, and 4 all represent dif different initial conditions, uh, we can see that, you know, each of them starts off uh, in a slightly different place and there's some sort of wandering around uh, on the graph until eventually they all settle down uh, and reach a steady state of mu. Uh, and that is a sign that we have convergence. So regardless of what our initial condition was, in the long run, we get there in the end. We're not going to talk about systems where there is no convergence. Um, every sample path, or almost everyone, will behave well enough uh, if we take enough samples. Uh, that is, we get past those initial conditions. We're going to have to uh, interrogate that a little bit. Uh, and so uh, we have to talk about sampling and uh, measurement and testing. Uh, and you probably have an idea of what an average is. Um, you know, you probably calculate your term average every term. Um, but what I'm actually interested in talking about here has two different things, uh, two kinds of average, a time average and an ensemble average. 
let's consider a scenario uh, in which we have a uh, single first come first serve queue. Every second, a new job arrives with probability p, and if there's any work to do, then the job in progress is completed with probability q, and q is greater than p, so our system is not overloaded. Uh, as a definition, we're going to say that we're going to use the term n of v to say the number of jobs in the system at time v. In this story, we have uh, two people. There are TAs, if you will, Tim and Enzo, trying to simulate this first-come, first-serve system to make a determination about what the average number of jobs is in that system. All right. There are two strategies, and I want you to think about who's right and who's wrong. Tim decides he's going to run it as one really long simulation. So start up the simulation, let it run for a very long time, uh, and just run the simulation over and over again, keeping track of um, samples. And samples are, you know, periodically you take a look, uh, or every so often, uh, take samples to identify what is the state of the uh, queue, how many items are in the backlog, how are we doing. Okay, uh, and then in the end, uh, he takes the average over all of the samples that he's taken from this one long run, uh, and that's it. That's how he produces his average number of jobs in the system. Enzo does something different. Instead of having one very long simulation, he does uh, a thousand shorter simulations, uh, and he waits until the uh, simulation is run for 1,000 seconds, then samples the queue at exactly t equals 1,000, uh, and then uh, obtains one value. The experiment is restarted with a new random seed, uh, and so you know, there are different initial conditions uh, on the next go-around. After obtaining 1,000 samples, he averages these, uh, and Enzo produces an average for the number of jobs. And so considering both of these strategies, who did it correctly? Here, here's Tim, and here's Enzo. Okay. The time average uh, has some potential problems uh, in that we're looking only at a single sequence and maybe this is just very unlucky. The initial conditions that we chose might have been the worst or the best possible, uh, and we end up uh, end up with a um, unrepresentative outcome. Um, the ensemble average is probably more like what we talk about when we think about a system being at steady state, um, you know, past the initial conditions. So we like the Enzo approach, uh, and also the Enzo approach makes it a lot easier to do a parallel approach. You can run several simulations concurrently, uh, and that's okay. Um, we kind of like Enzo's approach. Tim's approach still has some merit, though. It's you know, not necessarily you know, terrible. Um, but both the Tim and Enzo approach require that samples take place sort of at the right times. Enzo needs to make sure that you know, the time he chose of 1,000 seconds is far enough along into the simulation that the initial costs have attenuated. So the startup costs, anything like that. Uh, so the measurement is actually at steady state. Uh, and Tim needs to make sure that the uh, startup conditions, the initial costs, are impacting a sufficiently small portion of the measurements that they don't throw it off, right? You know, if it's only you know, the first 2% of measurements, then, yep, yeah, you know, that's fine. The, uh, the data is going to be valid. Uh, it will tell us uh, the answers that we are interested in. Okay, but assuming that we both uh, have Tim and Enzo doing that, you know, who did it right? Well, the answer is everyone's a winner, potentially. If we have a nicely behaved system, then the time and the ensemble average are the same, in which case both of them are correct and everybody's happy. Nobody did it wrong. What is a nicely behaved system? Ah, it's that word uh, that was up at the top of the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the um, lecture title, uh, ergodic. All right, I used a fancy word, but what does it mean? What, what is this fancy word and what does it do? Um, ergodic has a three-part definition, positive recurrent, aperiodic, irreducible. Um, that didn't help either, did it? I told you a word and I said, okay, it has a definition that has three words. Uh, and those three words are 
not necessarily any more transparent. I mean, a periodic maybe, um, but we have to investigate um, each of those things to understand it a little bit better. I'm not going to approach them in that order. I'm actually going to talk about irreducibility first. So irreducibility means a process should be able to get from one state to any other. In our case, state is the number of jobs in the system. So that is, if we start off with zero jobs, or we start off with 10 jobs, or we start out with 100 jobs, it doesn't matter. We could always get to a state of there are three jobs in the queue, or a state of zero jobs in the queue, uh, or two, or 27, or anything like that. So that makes the system irreducible because we have the ability for it to be in any state. That makes sense when we are talking about uh, something like measuring a queue size uh, in that it's easy to have you know, any number of items in the queue, uh, an arbitrary number of items in the queue for that matter. Positive recurrence. Positive recurrence says that given an irreducible system, any state I is revisited infinitely often, and the time between visits to that state are finite. Obviously, it assumes that you know it's running, uh, you know, for uh, an infinite time, so that you could you know uh, revisit uh, infinitely often. Um, but you get the idea. Um, so you could define a particular point as being a restart. The logical choice in the uh, view of a queue is the idea of the queue being empty. Uh, every time when the queue gets down to zero jobs, it's the same as if you start it up. Because if you start and the queue has nothing in it, every time you get the queue down to zero, you could treat it as if it is exactly the same as we just started. There was nothing in the queue. There's nothing going on. We're good. Uh, and then um, this is kind of what makes Tim and Enzo's view potentially the same, the idea of positive recurrence. Uh, a single long run is just like a number of independent runs. Uh, and if you have the Tim view and you just cut it up, uh, you know, stop and you know, take out that chunk everywhere that we have a, uh, every time we have a restart where it gets down to zero, uh, then it's you know, as if it's Enzo's view. Uh, and if you have Enzo's view and you just sort of tape them together every time it gets down to, uh, every time you get to the end, you just smash them together, um, then it works. The third condition is aperiodicity, uh, and that's required for the ensemble average to exist and or make sense. Uh, and that just means that the number of jobs in the system can't be dependent on the uh, elapsed time. Right. Um, otherwise, uh, if Enzo chooses at t equals 1000 and uh, at um, t equals 999, you always throw a bunch of jobs in the queue. That would mean it's not aperiodic because the system, in fact, has a period. Uh, and that is uh, at 999 seconds, it dumps more jobs in the queue. So the value that you read at t equals 1000 uh, will be affected by the fact that it is always... Um, it is always being changed immediately before that, and the number of jobs in the system is dependent on what time it is, and what time it is is very important in that. If all of those conditions hold, so irreducibility, positive recurrence, and aperiodicity, then both Tim and Enzo are correct, uh, and you can take one long uh, run and split it up every time there's a restart, or you can take several runs and stitch them together. It doesn't matter. They all end up with the same result, uh, and the average that you calculate will be valid either way. And that's what you want. That's you know, winning. Uh, again, it's uh, it's helpful well, when everybody wins. You know, good outcome. Okay, <clears throat> that means, however, if our system fulfills these criteria, that um, well, we can compute um, actually either one of these, uh, either the time average or the ensemble average, depending on uh, which one you think is easier. Um, and we give a formula here for the time average uh, as limit as t goes to infinity. Uh, the sum from 1 to a of t, uh, t sub i, where a of t is the number of arrivals uh, by time t, and t i is the time in the system of that arrival. So how long they spend hanging around in there. So if jobs arrive and they spend 10 seconds in the queue, uh, on average, that's the TI value. Uh, and then uh, you also have your count of arrivals and you just divide it. So if there are 10 jobs and they each spend 10 seconds, that's 100. Uh, and and uh, divide it uh, and by 10, so your average is 10. Easy. Straightforward. 
Okay, uh, and the ensemble average uh, may even be easier to calculate, where uh, the you know, all your calculating is limited as t goes to infinity, the expected value of t sub i, uh, which is saying the average time in the system of job i, where the average is taken over all sample paths, uh, and if the average job is in the system for 10 seconds, as I said before, well, the expected value here is 10, because I told you it's the average value, so I did the expected value calculation for you already. Uh, in which case, yep, both answers are 10. They both agree that's not a coincidence, uh, and we are okay with calculating it either way, depending on which one you think makes the most sense. Obviously, you got to do your measurements and everything to make it work, but it is helpful, uh, and that is... So that it is helpful that you have um, a system that is ergodic because then you can calculate your average and take your samples however you think makes the most sense. Um, so uh, you could um, take a look at various systems that we have talked about thus far in the course and uh, there used to be uh, an assignment that was based around load balancing and one of the things that I could ask uh, and it was even an exam question is basically you know, argue that uh, the system in question is ergodic and you have to then justify why it is the case. Um, that system had random arrival of jobs, you know, using a random number generator. Um, so uh, you know, that satisfied a periodic. Uh, it did have a queue-based system, so you could say there was recurrence uh, every time uh, the queue got down to empty. Uh, and uh, also it was irreducible because, again, as a queue-based system, uh, it really wasn't any different than the uh, kind that we are talking about here uh, in this discussion, meaning that um, it is... Uh well, straightforward, uh, at least you know, for an exam question, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate that that previous problem was in fact uh, a good match for these criteria. So that covers all of the background that we really wanted to talk about in terms of you know, getting ready uh, for working with queuing theory, uh, and in the next topic we are going to apply it.